incredible way, I'm going to be speaking about three very special Jewish boys. Uh, there was a fourth Jewish boy, but three in particular by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've heard songs about them. We've heard sermons about them. But today, I'm going to be sharing about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they are really made famous by the fire that they went through. And I am going to get to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. But I think it's very, very important that I lay a foundation to show you how they actually landed in the fire, how they coped in the fire, and how they succeeded in getting out of the fire. But before I get to that, it's important for us to have a bit of a, a background, a bit of a backdrop on the situation that the world was facing that's very relevant to what we are facing right now. The most dominant person in the world at that time was a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And this man was the most powerful man in the world. The richest, <clears throat> the most militant, a very smart man, very wise man. And this man had a kingdom that was known as the Babylonian Empire. And this was a vast array of land. He went from city to town, to village, to nation, to region, to territory, and he invaded everyone. And because his army was so powerful, you couldn't stop him from taking over your nation. But where he was really, really smart was that he let the existing kings and the existing rulers stay in place in that kingdom as long as they bowed down and worshipped him and acknowledged him as the overall king. But what he did was he would take their gods and their treasures back to Babylon, which was the main city in that whole uh, uh, empire. Chaldean Empire. Now, I want to read to you how great Babylon was. This was the greatest city in the world, the most beautiful city in the world. Uh, I'm going to read to you some facts. The walls around the city were 60 miles long, 15 on each side. The walls of the city were 300 feet high and 35 feet deep because he didn't want the invading uh, armies to try and attack his city. So he made sure that he went down so that they couldn't dig tunnels underneath. Very smart. There was a quarter mile of space around the wall, around his city, and he made a moat so that you couldn't uh, just run up to the walls. There was a lot of water in between. There were 250 towers, 100 gates of brass and centuries posted everywhere. And his palace alone was 50 feet thick. That's incredible. His walls around the city were 300 feet high, but they were 80 feet thick. Now, there's a very famous historian, Herodotus, who said that because the walls of the city were so wide, he could have chariot races around the walls of the city and the size of the city was about the size of Chicago. So a pretty big city. Nebuchadnezzar loved architecture. He loved buildings. He, he, it says here that he engaged on a building spree, a monumental building project, and renovated and refurbished 13 of his cities. Nebuchadnezzar II, that's who we're talking about, built three major palaces, and he decorated all of them magnificently, and they say his palace was arguably the greatest uh, palace ever built. So where does Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fit into all of this? Well, Israel was at a time in its history where they were rebelling against God. They were sinning in against God, and as a result of their sin, God sent judgment on the children of Israel, and that judgment came in the person of Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar himself and his armies invaded Jerusalem, and it was, it was a standoff because Jerusalem also had their walls, but he sacked Jerusalem, he, he invaded the temple, he tore down the temple, 
and he took all the, the, the items in the temple back to Babylon, but he also took thousands and thousands of Jewish people back to Babylon and included in the thousands of people that he took back to Babylon was Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. So let's read from Daniel chapter 1 and verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought these articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring in some of the children of Israel. So Nebuchadnezzar had such a vast kingdom that he needed people to rule and reign in his kingdom. He needed governors, he needed senators, he needed administrators, and he knew these Jewish boys were pretty smart. So he said to the king of the eunuch, get some of the Jewish boys, the smartest Jewish boys you can find, and bring them to the palace and put them in training in our academy. And I'm going to read to you what, what happened in this academy. The names of the three boys were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but those weren't their real names. Their Hebrew names were Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. So I want you to put yourself into the shoes of these Jewish boys. Your nation is invaded. You're taken to a foreign nation. You're scared. You don't know what's going to happen. You think you're going to be enslaved like the children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt. You're taken to a nation that has another language. You don't even know what they're talking about. Just imagine the fear and anxiety that were in these Jewish boys, but it wasn't. I believe that it wasn't because they knew that God had a plan for their life. They knew that they were serving the Lord, that they were going to Yeshiva, that they were studying the Word of God, that they were obeying the, the, the laws of God, and they knew the history of the Jewish people. They knew that they were in a time in history where the leaders were rebelling against God, and they could see that judgment had come, but their confidence was in God. Their confidence was in a miracle working God. And maybe you are going through a challenge like that. You have been taken out of a certain situation. I've had some of my dear friends tell me that they've been uh, let loose from their jobs. And, and some of them have, have been given less hours. You've been taken out of a situation and you feel like, what's next? I don't understand why I'm going through all of this. The encouragement I have to give to you today is keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on our miracle working God and he will bring you through the situation. The same way he brought Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego and Daniel through the situation. He's going to bring you through the situation. Amen. Deuteronomy 28 verses 8 says, The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all that you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. They were taken out of the land. They were taken out of Jerusalem, and they were put in a city called Babylon. Just put yourself in their situation. Psalm 146 verses 9, the Lord watches over the strangers. Now in their, in their Hebrew training, they would have learned all these scriptures. They would have learned the word of God. So they would have had confidence in the word of God. When you're taken out of a situation and you don't know what is next, you need to know the word of God. You need to, to, to be rooted in the word of God because the word of God is going to help you through everything that you're going through now. God says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So it's so important during this time of unsettling and uneasiness to get into the Word of God, especially now everyone has a lot more time th than usual. Use this time to get into the Word of God. I hear some people saying, oh, I'm, I'm watching all the series on all these channels. Forget it. Those things aren't going to help you. Those things aren't going to set you up for success. Those, those things are going to entertain you, but let's be honest, it's a waste of time. Use this time valuable, val, in, in a valuable way. I can't say valuably. <laughs> uh, Romans 8.28 says, 
and we know that all things work together for, for the good of those that love God. These Jewish boys love God to those that are called according to his purpose. God had a plan and a purpose for their life. And as long as they were in God's plan and purpose, no matter what was happening around them, wasn't going to move them, wasn't going to shake them. As long as you are in God's plan and purpose, God is going to elevate you. God is going to promote you like he ended up promoting these boys. Isaiah 58 verses 11, And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. They knew the word of God, so they weren't moved by their nation being sacked. They weren't moved by the temple being destroyed. They weren't moved by being taken into a foreign land because they knew that God was going to set them up. They studied about Joseph. These Jewish boys, they knew the story about Joseph. They knew how Joseph w w was thrown into a pit how he was he sold into slavery. They knew how Joseph landed up in Potiphar's house and how Joseph landed up in the prison and then how Joseph landed up in, in front of Pharaoh and, and he ended up running the country and they said, God, if you can do it for him, Joseph, you can do it for us. They knew in their hearts, I believe, that, that this was a divine setup. God is going to set you up. So what you need to do during this time is you need to position yourself. And one of the ways you can position yourself is point number two, is you need to train. You need to train. They got trained. Daniel 1 verses uh, 3, let me start at the beginning and then we can catch up. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men, now, now, let me just break that down. He, he said, bring me some of the Jewish guys. Now, the Jewish guys that were brought in, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, they, they were kind of like slaves in a way, but they weren't slaves. He wanted to use them in positions of leadership, but he needed their brains. He needed them because they were smart. Uh, he, he, he very possibly never knew about Joseph. And how, how Pharaoh in Egypt used Joseph to run everything. And he knew that these Jewish boys know how to run things. I'm sure even in, you guys know, Jewish businessmen are good at running things. They're good at being the chairman and the CEO and managers and directors. It's good to have Jewish people in your, in your company. And then it says, some of the king's descendants, the king wanted his his offspring, his, his sons and daughters to have positions of authority, but he wasn't just going to hand it to them. He needed to train them. His own children, his nieces and nephews, they needed to be trained to run this whole great empire. And then it says young men uh, that were of the nobles. He needed business people's kids to be educated. You see, even Nebuchadnezzar knew, I'm not just going to give a handout to my relatives or to my friend's kids, no, they have to work for it. I don't want to just uh, have nepotism running rampant. I want to make sure that my people are trained. Now, this is a great opportunity for God to get your attention, for you to be trained to do all that God has called you to do. It says here that he wanted them to not have any blemish, good looking, who qualifies? We all qualify. We're all good looking. Gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand. Who had the ability to serve in the king's palace and whom he might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Just imagine that. These boys, these young men, I call them boys. Uh, when you're my age, you can call young men boys. These boys had to learn a whole new language of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily ration of the king's delicacies, in verse 5, of wine that he drank, and three years of training. These boys had to go through intensive training for three years. It was like an academy for leadership. They, they were really smart boys, quick to understand, the, all, all the noblemen, all, all the Jewish guys, and, and all the 
or the royal family. So, so they had to be smart, but they still went through three years of training. So at the end of the time, they might serve before the king. That was the objective. Now, from among the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave them the names. Daniel, he called Balthazar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies. This is what would happen. They would bring the animals to the temple and then they would wring the necks of these animals, pretty cruel. Then they would offer them up to the gods. So these were animals offered up to the gods. And then the animal was dead. And then they would sell it to the butchers in Babylon, who would in, obviously sell it to the people. So Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't want to defile themselves with food that was offered to the gods. So they basically said, to the eunuch in charge of them, we don't want to do that. Just give us fruit and vegetables and everything will be okay. And then it goes on here in, in verse 8. Sorry, verse 9. Now God brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear the Lord, the king, who has appointed you food and drink. For why should you? he see your faces look worse than the young men who are your age. Then you would endanger my head before the king. <coughs> he was scared his head was going to get chopped off. Verse 11. So Daniel said to the steward from the chief of the eunuchs who had, was set over Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our parents be examined before you and the parents of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. So it was going to be a, a competition. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. Remember, you have to be tested. You're going through a test. And at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away the portion of the delicacies of wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. So these guys became super healthy and super fit. As for these four men, God gave them. I want you to note that God gave them. God wants to give you. God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in visions and dreams. What do you need from God? to fulfill the assignments that God has for you. God can give you wisdom and understanding in the assignment that he has for you. If he's called you to be a doctor, he can give you that wisdom and that grace. He's called you to be a businessman. He's called you to be a politician. He's called you to be an educator. He's called you into the media world. He's called you into ministry. Whatever area of life God has called you, trust him to give you a spirit of wisdom and understanding in that which he's called you to do. Proverbs 22 verses 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. We need to be intentional of being trained, and when you are someone who is trained, you need to be intentional in training others. We call that discipleship. Discipleship is teaching people how to follow the Lord the same way you follow the Lord. Discipleship is teaching people how to have faith. If you're someone who has a lot of faith, you need to teach others how to have faith. Whatever area in life you are gifted, you can train people up in that area. We, myself and Lucinda, we are very intentional in training up our children in the word of God. We read them Bible stories. We encourage them to watch uh, Bible stories on TV. Cody enters all these Bible quiz competitions with, uh, with Kin and, and people from the church. And um, it's, it's a great way of being trained up in the Word of God. We are intentional in discipling. I, I always speak to Zach about the Lord. Zach asks me questions about the Lord. 
Uh, Liam is still a little baby, but we, we speak the word of God. Last night, he was, he's only one, nearly two years old. He, he was grabbing a Bible, and, and we were telling him things from the Bible. We are intentional. It doesn't just happen uh, uh, automatically. You have to be intentional. It takes effort. It, sometimes it's so tiring. You're exhausted. You've had a long day doing whatever you have to do, and then you, you get home or now your kids are there and, and you're tired and, and, and you say, oh, I'm, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll teach them the word of God tomorrow. We'll pray tomorrow. And, and, and that's, how we can, that's how we lose our kids. So we need to be intentional in training them. Spiritually, but also in, in, in the ways of the world. I, I'm always teaching Cody and Zach. We drive past an apartment uh, block where they, they may be doing some construction and I say, hey, hey, how much do you think it costs to build this? And how much do you think they're going to sell it for? And would you rather sell the apartments or have tenants in the apartments? If you sell the apartments, you'll make a profit. If you put the tenants in, you'll have passive income coming in. So I'm busy teaching them. They're only like one, four, and seven, but I'm intentional in teaching them. Uh, we play a lot of tennis together. So, so I'm also training them physically, but in training them physically, I also have to train them mentally because you can be a sports person, you can be a person in life that just takes whatever people dish out to you, but to be a leader, you need to be, you need to be um, confident in God and you need to be confident in your ability and that confidence comes when you do have the ability. So, so even the other day, we, I was playing tennis with Cody and Zach, and we have all these mantras like train hard, win easy, the harder I practice, the better I get. No, and then they say mercy. So when you're beating your opponent, you know, don't give them a, a chance to fight back. Uh, that's intentional. That's part of training. Otherwise, when the devil comes in like a flood, you're just going to take everything that the devil has for you. When sickness comes, are you just going to accept it? When poverty comes to visit you and knocks on the door, are you just going to take it? Or are you going to rise up in the name of Jesus and fight back? And the way we fight back as Christians is by speaking the word of God over our situation and taking action. God hasn't called us to fit in. He's called us to stand out. So I want to encourage you to train yourself. Whatever area in life God has called you to be, train yourself in that situation. Enroll in some courses. Jared, I've already done college. That's great. Keep studying. Become the best you can be. Become an expert. Become the world champion in what you do. If you, if you are a waiter or a waitress or waitress, be the best waiter on the planet. Have a, good, have a smile. Have a good attitude. Go over and above to your clients. And guess what? They're going to tip you generously. I was listening to a, 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 a boxer the other day, and, and he were, it was like a leadership lesson. And he was talking about his girlfriend that was a waiter at Denny's. And this was like 10 years ago near Disneyland. And people would come in with their kids, but there was nothing for the kids there was no like crayons and, and things to draw on and there was nothing to keep the, the kids uh, occupied. So she would buy uh, coloring in books and crayons and just entertain the kids. And everyone that came to Den Denny's there by Disneyland wanted to be served by her. A and when she gave the, the check, she would get up to $50 tips. So she was trying to be the best waiter she could be. Maybe you're washing cars. Be the best car washer you can be. Be the best uh, window washer you can be because if you are the best and you train yourself, it won't take long before you are doing the windows for skyscrapers and you're going to have dozens and hundreds of people working for you. So whatever God has called you to do, be the best you can be. Train yourself. These Jewish boys train themselves for three years. They could have had a bad attitude. I'm not going to give it my best. We slaves in this foreign land. Why do I have to learn another language? Uh, I hate studying this history. I don't even believe in the system. Uh, I don't even admire the art. I don't even admire the city. They could have had a bad attitude and they wouldn't have got anywhere. But they train themselves. I want to encourage you to train yourself. 2 Timothy 3, 7, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. 
and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. God wants you to be complete. Equipped. It says you are thoroughly equipped, 2 Timothy 3. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. God wants you to be equipped. How do you get equipped? You study, you train, you volunteer, you help, you go on courses, you humble yourself, you get a mentor. I've always loved to have mentors uh, uh, that, that have already done what I want to do. So when I wanted to be an evangelist, I said, who's the greatest evangelist in the world? Reinhard Bonnke. I'm going to do everything I can to get to try to connect with Reinhard Bonnke, which by the grace of God I did, and, and we ended up having an amazing relationship. I went on him uh, to about 20 crusades around the world. I visited him at his home. He's prayed over my kids. We've had such sweet fellowship. Uh, but I was in, intentional about getting Reinhard Bonnke to mentor me because I felt the Lord was calling me to lead millions of souls to Jesus. So I needed someone who could show me how to do it. So I want to encourage you, have a mentor in your life. Now, now one mentor can't fill everything, right? When I was growing up, especially in my 20s, I had a mentor for everything. I had a mentor in evangelism, a mentor in, in, in structure, in, in, in administration, a, a, a mentor to encourage me, a mentor for my health and fitness. So I want to encourage you, ask God to give you different mentors in life that can help to mold you and shape you into all that God has called you to be. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that God was going to promote them, that God was going to position them, so they had to get different mentors. Remember, they were studying for three years. They were studying literature. They were studying the language of the Chaldeans. They were studying history. Nebuchadnezzar loved architecture. He, he, his city was like a, like a seven-star resort. The architecture was ahead of its time. It was amazing. Uh, he had an incredible uh, uh, army. So, so they needed one of the generals to mentor them in tactics and strategy. So, so they had a whole lot of mentors. Who's your mentor? You need a spiritual mentor. You need a mentor for marriage. That's why it's so great that we're doing this marriage seminar where you can get equipped. You, you, need, a, you need a mentor, and, and, and so do I. I have mentors. Ephesians 6, 4, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition in the Lord. We need to train our children in the Lord. You see, there, there's two ways of training people. You can do it the Babylonian system which is wheeling and dealing and, and conniving and being cunning and ruthless and manipulating and using and abusing and being a tyrant and crushing people and all the bad stuff, or you can do it the Lord's way. You see, the Babylonian system is buying and selling. God's system, the kingdom system is, is sowing and reaping. So God doesn't want us to operate in the Babylonian system. He wants us to operate in his kingdom system. How do you know what his kingdom system is? You need to read the word. You need to open your Bible. I know it sounds difficult, but it's, uh, you need to do it. Open the word of God and study the word of God. And then you will know what God's will is to do in every situation. And then the final thing I want to focus on today was they were tested. Brothers and sisters, you are going to be tested in your faith. You're going to be tested in your marriage. You're going to be tested with your kids, tested with your finances, tested in your work, tested politically, tested spiritually. Uh, and remember, we have a devil. We have, we have demons that are, are coming against us to, to steal, kill, and to destroy. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said in John 10, 10, Satan comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. So don't think you receive Jesus and everything's hunky-dory. Everything is hunky-dory and great in your relationship with God. But remember, we have an enemy that hates us, that wants to trap us, that wants to trip us up. So they were tested, Daniel chapter 1 and verse 18. Now at the end of days when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Now imagine being brought in 
to the inner chamber of this great palace, here you have an audience with the most powerful man in the world militarily, the richest man in the world, a brilliant man who, who, who is great with architecture and, and leadership, you brought in and now you're standing before him and he's going to test you. Verse 19, then the king interviewed, that word interview actually is like tested them. And among them all, now listen to this. Now put your name in. None was found like your, you. Let that be our, our, our declaration that when you are tested, they're not going to find anyone as good as you in your work, in your school, in the church, in your neighborhood, in your community. There's not going to be anyone as good as you because you are a God-made man or woman. None was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore, they served before the king. Now listen to verse 20. This is profound. And in all matters of wisdom, what is wisdom? You see, you have facts where you know a lot of stuff, but then you get wisdom. Wisdom is knowing what to do in every situation. Highly brilliant, intelligent people with great IQs, 160, 180, 200, 220. Brilliant, brilliant people that know a lot of stuff. Some of them aren't wise in knowing what to do. They're like Google. You can ask them a question and they know the answer. But when you ask them for advice, they may be not too sure what to do. Make sure you're not someone who just knows a lot of facts, but someone who has the wisdom to put those facts uh, into, into a process. In all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them. So he was testing them. He was throwing them curveballs. He found them 10 times better. Imagine being 10 times smarter than your contemporaries, than your work colleagues. He was asking them questions about geography, questions about history, the history of the world, the history of the Chaldeans, the history of the different regions that he went into. He loved literature. He was asking them all kinds of questions of all the books and all the authors. He was asking them economic advice. And in every thing that he asked them advice, they were 10 times smarter than, now, now when I first read that, I was thinking something, and, and I, I think you're thinking that as well, but I'm going to shock you with what I'm now going to share. So he, they were 10 times smarter than, than their fellow students, right? No. He tested all the students. They were 10 times smarter than the wise men in Babylon. How incredible is that? Not only were they 10 times smarter or probably 100 times smarter than their fellow students, <clears throat> they were 10 times smarter than the smartest people in the whole empire. How smart were these Jewish boys? And not just with knowledge, but wisdom. So he could have said, well, we attacked this country and this is what they did. What would you have done differently? Four years ago, we were going through this economic thing with taxes, with this region or that region. Uh, Shadrach, what would you have done? Uh, this person built uh, this building. Uh, how would you have made it better? This is how we built the walls. What would you have done differently? So he was throwing all these things, and in everything that he asked them, they were 10 times smarter. How did they get that wisdom? They got it from the Lord. The Bible says God gave them a spirit of wisdom and understanding. They studied. They weren't slackers. They studied. But when they were in a situation, God showed them the right answer to give him. They were 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers in all his realm. Now, not magicians like uh, David Copperfield. They did do some crazy things. These are the wise men. These were the administrators running his kingdom. Thus, Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. 1 Peter 1, 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. 
Maybe you're going through that right now. You're going through trials in your finances, trials in your marriage, trials with your children. The Bible says here that we must greatly rejoice. Now, uh, what do you mean greatly rejoice? Are you kidding me, Lord? He's saying greatly rejoice. Why? Because it says, you have been grieved with various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold which perishes, though it be tested by fire. You know why we can rejoice? Because we know what the outcome is going to be. We can rejoice even if our children don't follow the Lord because we know at the end of the day we are trusting for their salvation. You can rejoice in the Lord even if you can't make rent because you have already seen God bless you with an amazing house. You can rejoice in the Lord in every situation because we know what the future holds for us. Read the, the, the back of the book. We win. We win. And if we stand in faith, God will bless us. Genesis 22, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. So sometimes we go through a test. Now God doesn't tempt with evil, but he does test. He tests our heart. He wants to know, are you going to serve me even when things don't look good? I've been through situations in my life. You've been through situations in your life where we, 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 we felt let down. We, we even felt like God let us down. And maybe the thought was even there, like, Lord, I'm, I'm going to believe in you, but I'm not going to serve you anymore. This is a waste of time. I sow and I sow and I sow, but why aren't I reaping? Abraham, God said to Abraham, and he said, here I am, Lord. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, who you love. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Psalm 66 verses 10. For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us like silver is refined. And finally, Deuteronomy 8, verses 2, And you shall remember the Lord your God, who led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness, to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commandments or not. It's so easy to love the Lord when everything is going great. We love the Lord, we rejoice, we raise our hands, we have a smile on our face, but what if... Satan comes in to steal, kill, and to destroy. Are you still going to love God? Remember Job? Job was the wealthiest man in the east. The wealthiest. And Satan came in and robbed him of everything. And he was being influenced by some of his friends. Make sure your negative friends don't influence you. Only, only have positive friends. Only have friends that are full of faith. But... but he started to develop a bad attitude and at the end he repented and he worshipped the Lord and God gave him back twice as much as was stolen. If you have a good attitude, if you put your faith and trust in God, if you keep tithing and giving and, 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 and speaking words of life and, and speaking the word, God will give you twice as much as you had when you were on top. I've had friends that have shared with me that they've lost their life savings, that they've lost their business. I've had many friends like that, many, many. Some of my friends were mega, mega wealthy guys. And now they have hardly anything. You know what? God can restore all that Satan has stolen. They were tested. Right now, some of you are being tested. Some of your family members are being tested. The country's been tested. The world's been tested. And in the testing, what are we going to do? Are we going to bow? Are we going to surrender? Or are we going to put our trust and faith in the Lord? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I will say, as a David of, myself, Lucinda, Cody, Zach, and Liam, we will serve the Lord. Eternity Church will serve the Lord. Save the World Foundation will serve the Lord. And I want to invite you today to make that proclamation. As for me and my house, say it with me. As for me and my house, 
We will serve the Lord. My faith and my trust is in the Lord. I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. I will do everything that God has called me to do. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm going over and not under. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm going to carry on next week because time doesn't allow me to carry on preaching. But I'm going to carry on next week preaching about how, how they were tested a, a, a little bit more and, and how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the, the fire, the fiery furnace. But I'm going to continue that next week. But I want to stop there because I believe that these are some valuable lessons that God is teaching you. I believe you need to take action right now. You need to say, Lord, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to follow you. I'm not going to be moved by what I read. I'm not going to be moved by what I see on TV. I'm not going to be moved by the doubters and the scoffers and the critics. I'm going to be moved by your word. That's number one. Number two, I'm going to train myself. I'm going to start exercising again. I'm going to start reading the Bible. I'm going to do some online courses to develop myself. I'm going to volunteer until, I, until my hours at work fill up. I'm going to sow. I'm going to volunteer. And in doing that, you are positioning yourself. Maybe there's some people today you've tuned in. I've even got some of my Jewish relatives that I'm, I'm, I'm sending links to watch this. Maybe some of my Jewish family are watching right now. The most important thing you can do right now is position yourself to have a relationship with God. And the way that we position ourselves to have a relationship with God is to say, God, I'm a sinner. Please save me. The Bible says there's only one Savior between heaven and earth. There's only one person that, that qualifies to take our sins away, and that's the Messiah, Yeshua, the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. He came from heaven to earth. He lived the sinless life. He opened the eyes of the blind. He made the cripples walk. He even raised the dead. But the Bible says that Jesus had enemies that hated him. They conspired against him. And they handed him over to be whipped 39 times. They spat on him. They ridiculed him. They whipped him on the back 39 times. And as they pulled off, it pulled pieces of skin and flesh off his back. They marched him through the streets of Jerusalem with a, a, a beam on his back, a wooden beam on his back. They marched him to Golgotha, the place of the skull. They lined up his hands and feet on the cross. They took thick, rusted, jagged nails of iron placed one by each hand and one by his foot, took a hammer and smashed it again and again through his hands and his feet. They lifted Jesus up on the cross for all the world to see. The blood coming out of his hands, coming out of his feet, his back, his face, his side. That blood, the blood of Jesus, has the power right now to take all your sins away. All you need to do is say, Jesus, save me. Jesus died on the cross. They put him in a tomb. One day went by, two days went by. Jesus was dead and buried. But something great happened on the third day. He rose from the dead and he's alive and he's knocking. He's knocking on the door of your heart. But the handle is on the inside. Only you can open the door of your heart and invite the Messiah and invite Jesus in to have a personal relationship. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. Now is your moment. This is your moment of decision to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Don't run from him. Run to him. His arms are open wide. 
ready to receive you just the way you are. You may feel like you're not worthy. You're not worthy. None of us are worthy. It's not by our good works that we can be saved. It's by the grace of God. Jesus did it all on the cross. He paid for every sin. You can't pay for anything. The debt has been paid. Jesus paid the price. All you need to do is receive it. Receive Jesus. While your eyes are closed, if that's you right now, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, if you believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross to take your sins away, if you believe in your heart that He was buried and He rose from the dead, and you believe that Jesus is alive and you want to give your life to Him, I want you to quickly put up your hand and say yes to Jesus. He loves you so much. You are so precious to Him. Just pray this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, I believe in my heart that you are the Son of God. I believe in my heart that you died on the cross to take my sins away. I believe in my heart that you were buried and on the third day you rose from the dead and you are alive. And right now I give my life to you, Jesus. My spirit, my soul, and my body. Everything I have, everything I am, I give to you. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, the Bible says you are born again. You are a child of God. And your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want to encourage you to start to read the Word of God. Start to see who God is and Jesus is and the Holy Spirit is. And to see what your inheritance is. Start to spend time talking to God. Worshiping Him. Singing to Him. Put on a Christian CD. Put on a, a Christian radio. And, and even if you don't know the words, you'll learn the words. Just so start singing to Him and worshiping Him. And something's going to happen in your heart. I also want to encourage you to get into a radical church. If you live in Orange County, Eternity Church is the church that I want to encourage you to join. It's our church. When this whole thing lifts, we meet at the Big Edwards Movie Theater opposite Fashion Island. Our services are on Sundays, 10 o'clock. We have a few movie theaters. One is for the main uh, service for the adults. The other one is Children's Church. <clears throat> we also do many outreaches during the week. We're involved in a Bible club at Corona Damar. Uh, in the next few months, we're going to start a Bible club at Harbor High in Newport Beach. We occasionally have a table at Fashion Island where we talk to people and pray to people. We plan in a great outreach in Santa Ana, Tina, who, who shared in the offering. Uh, she's managed to start to put together and, and us as a church, we're going to do a big outreach in Santa Ana with hundreds of people. We're going to feed people. We're going to have jumping castles. We're going to be having music and testimonies and we're going to preach the gospel. And, and we are trusting that dozens and dozens, please God, hundreds of people give their lives to Jesus. So we are not taking a step back. We are going forward. We want to see Orange County shaken by the power of God. Oh, and some other good news. Uh, we are now going to start a new zip code. This zip code has 16,000 homes in Newport Beach by East Bluff. And, and as far as the, the edge of Costa Mesa and the peninsula. Uh, the, and, and we have $2,000 of donations so far. One person gave $1,000. Another person gave $1,000. It works out to a dollar a home. So... We need another $14,000 for, for that zip code. But we are going to start with the $2,000 we have. And I know that God is going to increase it. He's going to make the, 
the fish and the, and the loaves multiply. Amen. Remember during the week to connect on Zoom. We have men's Bible study, women's Bible study, youth Bible study, worship Bible study. So, so go on to eternitychurchoc.com. And even if you somewhere else in the world, you can connect. We can have dozens of people on Zoom and, and you can join our, 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 our different Bible studies. Let me pray for you and then we're going to end with a, an amazing worship song. Father God, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you that we have the victory in you, Father God. Thank you that the church of Jesus Christ is not a pleasure boat, but a lifeboat for saving souls. And we are available as a church, Lord, to shine on the hill and to tell everyone that God loves them and Jesus loves them. We are the church, Lord, and we are available. And Lord, I want to pray for everyone that has listened to the sermon today, Lord God. Thank you that you fill them with your Holy Spirit. Lord, fill, just open your, open your heart right now. Lord, fill them with your Holy Spirit right now. I speak peace into your soul. I speak joy into your soul. I speak, Lord, Holy God, touch them now with your Holy Spirit. Touch in the name of Jesus. Receive the touch from heaven, the touch from our Father. I see him wrapping his arms around you. I see him hugging you, his cheek on you. Just close your eyes. Enjoy his hug. Enjoy this beautiful hug from the Lord. He's squeezing you, saying, my child, I love you. Everything's going to be okay. Nothing takes me by surprise. I will bring you through this situation and you will testify of, of how I protected you and blessed you. I have no favorites. I have no favorites, my boy, my girl. You are all my favorites. And when you see one of my children prospering, it's not that I'm choosing them over you. You can have what they have. You just need to do what they do. They speak life. They speak faith. They sow. And that's why they reap in. And you can reap as well. Just do what my word tells you to do. Be like Peter who stepped out the boat. The waves were crashing. The thunder was cracking. The disciples were looking and they, they were like, Peter, you're going to drown. Don't do it, Peter. It's a ghost. But Peter got out the boats. You're going to get out the boats. But Peter locked on to Jesus. I think he, he looked straight into the eyes of Jesus. And as he looked into the eyes of Jesus, Faith came into his heart. As you look into the eyes of Jesus, faith is going to come into your spirit. And he got out the boat and he walked on the water. Even though everything was chaotic around him, it didn't touch him because his eyes were on Jesus. Even though things around you may seem chaotic, they're not going to touch you. The waves aren't going to touch you. The thunder's not going to hit you. You're not going to drown as long. It's conditional. As long as you keep your eyes on Jesus. I'm keeping my eyes on Jesus. My family, I'm going to keep encouraging them. And they encourage me. We're going to keep our eyes on Jesus. Eternity Church, we're going to keep our eyes on Jesus. America, South Africa, Israel, Australia, the nations of the world. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. And everything is going to be okay. And we are going to be more than conquerors. Because our eyes are on Jesus. God bless you.